Yeah, go ahead. If you don't mind. Well, practice means practice. <laughs> 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 so, I just invite you to listen for a moment and have some practice. many of you know that was a, a love song and it's about a path that strangely is largely unknown in the transpersonal world of those that came to the West from India. <clears throat> the, the name is Grahis, Grah, Grahastya which means uh, roughly enlightenment through romantic love whereby families are created and parents age become grandparents, have grandchildren, whose, have children whose children have children, and then die. It's a strangely missing path, although it is certainly the core foundation of the Indian culture, and all cultures, is to have been created by the romantic love, let us hope, of our parents meeting, having the lives whereby we're here today, some very mysterious way, that the seed of life is infinite. Uh, we all read in the Old Testament about, in the early pages about somebody begets somebody who begets somebody who begets. And I always thought that was kind of boring until recently I realized that it's the very profound reality that we don't think much about. The power of the infinity of, of, of creation, of procreation, of life. And so this path is not that well known in our field it focused more on consciousness than on seed. Although in Indian Sanskrit, you quickly learn that seed is more important than consciousness. We've just been focusing on it. I think because of LSD, Ram Das went to India to find out what is LSD because of its effect on consciousness, and they started telling us about consciousness. But seed is more critical because it's whereby we all become incarnate in here. No one is here. As uh, Shakespeare, I think, said in one of his plays, I think Macbeth, you know, uh, you have to be of woman born. It's a very deep thing that we, can, we see it, but we have to look at it with deeper eyes. For example, Ram Das, after teaching for 40 years that family life was a melodrama, if you know this quote, you could raise your hand, that he taught for 40 years that that family life was a melodrama and the real spiritual growth, you test it in your family. Actually, it's the reverse. 
is family life is spiritual growth of creating life, but we don't have that type of respect or perception. We've been scientized, uh, even the term reproduction has replaced procreation. Pro meant on the behalf of the creator, life comes forth. Genetic research is the outcome. GMO, the manipulation of the material plane around the seed. Ram Dass in 209 found out that he had a grandchild and a, an adult child, which he dreaded finding out. You can check this out in the Huffington Post where he was interviewed in 209 or 210. And he was hoping that this paternity suit that had been filed about him was not true and the DNA test came back. Lucky for us and mm -hmm. unlucky. He said, I had no idea when he saw his grandchild for the first time, he was like 70 or so years of age, and I must say, I love this man. Uh, I don't, and I, and I appreciate very deeply that he has always admitted his mistakes many times, and we should all learn from that. But he did uh, find out that when he looked at his, uh, his young grandchild, that he had made a big mistake again, that in fact, loving a, a child was very similar to loving God. And I think he may have gone further than the article and had said it's not any different at all. But we don't have that background uh, of the last 40 years. That we have something about spiritual life that's different from creating life. 95% of the Indo-Tibetan archive has not yet been translated. We're make, if, once you start t uh, talking with particularly Tibetan translators and Sanskrit translators, you realize how many mistakes are being taken as truth. My area is Kundalini and Tantra, and I can tell you just a tip, Kundalini should be translated as gestation. How many have heard that translation? How many have heard it more about an energy that goes up the spine? Yeah, energy up the spine that res resonates with an LSD experience. That's what we were looking at uh, to see what was going on in, in these spiritual traditions. It has very little to do merely with an energy up the spine. It has to do with mother. If you translate it, it talks endlessly about mother. Mother is gestation of life. Let me read a, just a brief poem that I tried to capture uh, love, romantic love, uh, as a path. Each preferring to give, nothing was ever lost. Stretching ourselves thin for one another, we became vast. Easing the way for me, for you, as the decades wandered on, no sorrow or illness endured alone. I am here, you said, I'm not going anywhere. And when my grip weakens, then my gaze upon you will lock. When that at last should blur, then resolute in my heart shall you remain. Your name, the last sound on my lips. Your lips, the last image in my mind. Thank you very much, Stuart, for your nice opening and uh, um, for these words at the end. And thank you, thank you, everybody. Well, uh, for me, it's very special to be here today. I have been in ITP uh, 20 years ago during an open doors event. And today I'm uh, here in another kind of open doors as a presenter, through the big door. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you, thank you very much, Stephen, Stephen Smith. Thank you very much, Sophia University. Thank you, Eurotas, the European uh, Transpersonal Association. And thank you for the transpersonal movement. That's why I'm here. And that's why I'm very grateful. I um, was trained by uh, um, Salvador Roquette, a um, Mexican psychiatrist, in uh, sacred plants. 
and indigenous uh, uh, traditions. I've uh, worked uh, very intensively in Mexico with different healers, and all these experiences gave me an holistic vision of, uh, that we are trying to communicate to our students. We have created an institute of transpersonal psychology in Barcelona about 20 years ago. We have three missions. To train as a clinic for patients and a base for communicate information and broadcasting. We have teaching teachers coming from different countries. We also teach, run courses, and we have a program in training psychology and psychotherapy, transpersonal. Conscient presence and integral listening, or the majestic capacity of shamans and healers for listening without words. Mm. Or, uh, in young uh, words, the self-healing potential, the trust in the process, and the psychotherapy as a co-creation. All these items that uh, that's why um, which ones we are work and we um, teach in our institute we work also in the qualities of the presence acceptance unconditional openness qualities that we see we think that the psychotherapies the transpersonal psychotherapies have have to to, to have devotion, adaptability, integrity, empathy, compassion, and creativity, co-creativity, because uh, psychotherapy is an uh, act of co-creation between two or more people. I'm very touched, and really touched, for this warm uh, auditory, this warm people, this warm public. But many, but I know among them, some of you, you, you met me in different places, in India, in Russia, in France, in Barcelona, in California. And that's why I want to be short, because I want to listen to my colleagues. <laughs> and uh, I want to stop here and only thank you again for to be here and, and see you later. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, six minutes is going to go by very quickly. Thank you, Ray. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. When you get into these shamanic branches, yes. Just, you know. yes, we step outside of time and space, we go into non ordinary reality. I was, I was trying to think, oh, <laughs> I was trying to think just what it is I would like to say about my practice and the work that I do. Um, and there, there's so much to say, but I will limit it for this, um, on this panel, trying to get within the five or six minutes. There were a lot of things that were said in, by Stan and also by Jim that really applied to my life and what led me to the work that I'm doing. Um, I've always had a vision of the universe as sacred. As, um, as a kid, I was raised Catholic, and the guardian angel wasn't an act of faith, it was an experience for me. So, to me, it wasn't like as if there were, or just kind of hold it on faith that there is, and then, you know, 
it was a, an actual experience for me. And the thing that was interesting that I found was, not maybe not interesting is the right word, it was sad, that there was nobody I could talk to. There was absolutely nobody. I couldn't talk to my parents because they had this you know, vision of Catholicism that was just like theology. I couldn't talk to my friends because they thought I was nuts if I told them that I had conversations with my spirit guides, right? And even in school, none of this stuff was taught. As Jim pointed out, in indigenous cultures, it's common to, to know or to believe in spirits and to work with spirits, to acknowledge your ancestors, to care about the earth, to make decisions that affect the next seven generations. I wasn't raised in that context, but yet something in me spoke that that was really important. For most, much of my early life, I did give up my soul to be accepted. I was a Catholic. I was, I was trained how to appease and how to not be myself, but just be someone that could be accepted. And I realized later that this was good training for my shamanic work because I would become a chameleon. I could be whatever Ray wanted me to be, Lena wanted me to be, and Greta wanted me to be. And although at the time I was doing it unconsciously, it was a really good practice for the work that I do much later. I did find a, when I broke away from the church, I felt, I found psychology. And that seemed to speak to me much more than the Catholic religion. And fortunately, I got involved with Jung, who directed me towards Eastern religions and spirituality and all the practices that were talked about, the meditation, the yoga, the pranayama, the, the fasting, the um, reading the sacred text, all these kind of things. And I did get into clinical psychology, but I was really disillusioned. It was so focused on pathology and it didn't seem to speak to me. And although I truly value my background in clinical psychology, it, did, it didn't have juice for me. There was something that was missing. And fortunately, I was able to get into a, a program of humanistic psychology, which actually did speak to me. The fact that, you know, looking at the healthy aspects of human nature. Well, that led to an experience where I actually went on a vision quest. And a vision quest, as you know, is going out in the wilderness by yourself, crying for a vision. And on this vision quest, I had an experience of a very non-ordinary reality in a sense that my heartbeat started becoming very audible. And to make a long story short, I thought I was having a heart attack, and I thought I was going to die. But I could actually hear. Never heard it before, I've never heard it since. And that heartbeat was like a drum beat for me. It took me on a journey where I went somewhere. There was a shift in my consciousness. I went somewhere, I met some out animal spirits, and had an incredible experience, one that I'd never really heard about or had any clue about. And when I came back, I had this experience of unitive consciousness. All this thing, these things I've been t reading about in books for years and years, I had an experience of, and it completely changed my life. This one little journey completely transformed my outlook on life, my connection with the earth, connection with animals, connection with people, connection with myself, connection with spirit. So I looked a little deeper into it and was able to learn a little bit more about shamanism. And is it 30 seconds already? Oh, one minute, okay. So what I do in my practice is I do shamanic counseling. And shamanic counseling has two forms. One is someone that does not want to learn how to journey, to do the shamanic journey, comes to me, I journey for them, and we discuss that. The other form that I do, which is I prefer to do, is to teach people how to actually do the shamanic journey. Now, I don't teach people to become a shaman. There's a difference there. That's not something that can be taught real easily. It's a longer process. But what I do 
is to give people an experience of what the shamanic journey is like, what shamans have been doing for tens of thousands of years, of stepping between the two worlds, of having a connection with spirit, having a connection with the elements, and to be able to connect to spirit in a way that you can have direct revelation, you can find healing, you can find guidance, you can find empowerment in a fairly simple method. Um, and the thing is that what's really interesting for me is that there is, there is no place for what I just said and what the kind of work I do within mainstream clinical psychology. There are diagnostic categories for what I just said. Spirits don't exist, we all know that. You can't step between the world. What do you mean non-ordinary reality? What you're doing is teaching people how to dissociate. Well, what I found, I've been doing this for, since about 1974, I, have, I know the difference between reality and non-reality. I don't feel that I'm a very disassociative type of person. I also found that people not only do not disassociate through doing and learning this practice, they actually become more grounded, more balanced, and much more integrated. We live, most of our people in our society are very alienated, dispirited, disempowered, and disconnected. And what I've found is that in the, this practice of teaching people how to journey, how to connect with spirit, how to step between the two worlds, and how to have this practice become normal is a great way to be spirited, to be connected, to find balance, to find empowerment, and um, it's a way to connect with one's soul as well as the earth, the elements, spirit, and each other. So, um, how can I say it? Did you wave me yet? Oh, okay. So, let's see. okay, as I said, six minutes is crazy. So I will just thank you for the opportunity to share the, the work that I do. And if you have any questions, you can ask me afterwards. Thank you. I'm Luigi Latuada from Milan, Italy. I am grateful and happy to be here. I, have, uh, I am director of Integral Transpersonal Institute that has two programs. One is a training of, in transpersonal psychotherapy, fully accredited by the Ministry of the University of Education and Research. That is, we can, f we can degree medical doctor and psychologist in psychotherapy, and then other in counseling. Uh, but I want to start from the end. The most important thing that I understood in 35 years of clinical work and spiritual practice is that uh, when you disappear to yourself, you find yourself. When we pass to the zero, we enter the transpersonal field. You really understand what is, uh, what, what does it mean, transpersonal. And I realized that uh, all these 35 years in which I create, I founded a discipline biotransenergetics that is, uh, of course, is a psychotherapy, but is something more, is uh, an integral, transpersonal, psycho-spiritual discipline, or is my path that I am sharing since uh, 84 with uh, thousands of people. So I understood that all these 
work in these 35 years was just to realize that we had to disappear, to ourselves. And uh, so, biotransenergetics, that is my methodology of work, that is of my way of life, of life, of life is a, a technology of sacred, is something to learn and to remember me in every time that I have to disappear to myself. But I want to tell you a little story. In early 70s, I entered medicine faculty and I were fighting against the system to change the world. I think, uh, uh, like uh, many of you. And uh, in the late 60s, 70s, I went uh, to Brazil. No, I, I, I found, I met bioenergetics, that is uh, Lowen, Reich, uh, the work on uh, body psychotherapy. It was, uh, it was such a revelation for me and was very helpful for me. <coughs> but I felt that there was something missing. I don't knew what. And I realized that when in 82 I went to Brazil for the first time, my ex-wife is Brazilian, so we went to Brazil to find a, a family. For me, Brazil was just samba and carnival. I didn't like it at all. But since I am here, I said, I want to know something about Macumba, the syncretic cult no? rituals. I went uh, in one of these rituals and it was uh, one of the most transformative experiences in my life. For the first time, I realized what does it mean to shift from the head to the heart. Of course, we can read, we can knowledge what it is, but uh, I felt for the first time with all my bodies, of all my soul and my mind, what does it mean? I could merge, I could dive into something that I never knew. And uh, this this diving into the essence, into the spirits, into the, the field, into the mana, was a, a rebirthing for me. And was the beginning of biotransenergetics. Since that time, I started to to search which structures, which structures of behavior, which structure of feeling, of thinking, allow us to have such experience, to enter and to be in contact with the source, with the spirit, with the, the transformative process, the Mahamudra, let us say, in, Vedanta or Tantric way. So, since that time, I built up a technology, a methodology, that now I teach in the, these two schools. We have uh, hundreds of students and we have uh, quite an hundred of psychotherapists that in Italy are sharing biotransenergetics is such incredible for me. This is miracle. I invented something and now there are people that are working with this, that are helping people, that are transforming her and this life. It's a miracle and I am very grateful for this. Thank you. Brand Portrait, 
and I teach at CIS. Um, I find it actually kind of difficult to talk about my own practice. And part of it is that it's a, it's a constantly moving target. I feel like I am continually revising how I'm seeing this whole process of healing. Because to me that's the fundamental question. What is healing? And my way of thinking about that now is very different than I've thought about it <coughs> 10 years ago, or 5 years ago, or 20 years ago. And I realized that actually my own journey in terms of being a psychotherapist has corresponded to my own spiritual journey. Um, I began psychology really out of Buddhist practice. Um, that was really my first way into the inner world. Well, LSD first, yeah. then Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then psychology. And so the first 15 years or so, I was deeply immersed in sort of the ways in which Buddhism and mindfulness could be brought into psychology, and particularly Gestalt therapy, <coughs> existential psychology and psychotherapy, um, focusing um, somatic approaches. The whole humanistic existential stream spoke to me. While I was really deeply immersed in the, uh, the path of what Aurobindo calls the impersonal divine. And the path of the impersonal divine and of awareness and of coming into the here and now, coming into the body, it's powerful and beautiful. And then about 30 years ago, I read Sri Aurobindo. And Sri Aurobindo opened me up to another dimension of the divine, what he calls the personal divine. And I had always put down the personal divine coming out of Buddhism, of course, it had seemed um, kind of a, an illusion. But Aurobindo opened me up to the reality of this, and to the reality of the soul, and to the reality of the world. Um, <clears throat> and so in opening to the soul, in opening to the personal divine, my own psychotherapy began to change to be more <coughs> relational. I opened more to contemporary psychoanalytic ways of working. Much of the discourse in transpersonal psychology, um, I think, involves a lot of psychoanalysis bashing. And mostly, I think, it's creating a straw man for psychoanalysis. It's talking about the psychoanalysis of Freud or of the psychoanalysis of 50 years ago. But the psychoanalysis of today is bears scant resemblance to that. It is deeply relational. It is fundamentally relational, intersubjective. Um, <clears throat> and in some ways, it's really about the process of longing. In the same way that the soul longs for the divine, we long for connection. The heart longs for connection. So increasingly, I have shifted not away from Buddhism, but really including another dimension in my own spiritual practice. And it's really opened up this um, contemporary psychoanalytic way of working within, I think, a humanistic existential framework of also seeing how feelings exist in the body. So currently, I want to be as centered in the heart as possible. And since the soul speaks through the heart, right, in, in the personal divine traditions, and certainly in integral yoga. The soul actually is behind the heart chakra and communicates by feelings. Not so much by thought, but by feelings. And so I find myself more and more interested in looking at what are the blocks to the heart. That opening the heart seems to me a deeply psycho-spiritual process. That it's not just a spiritual process, it's not just a psychological process, it's a psycho-spiritual. I think in the description of this uh, panel, it said, how do you bring in the transpersonal into your clinical work? And to me, the, the question is somewhat put wrongly. It's not so much transpersonal something I bring in. It's not something added on. But the whole process is deeply transpersonal from the beginning. It's a psycho-spiritual process 
from the very beginning. <coughs> so I think coming out of Aurobindo, what is healing for me involves each of these four levels that he talks about. Body, heart, mind, and spirit. So all healing involves each of these. Some types, some persons, some issues, some dimensions more than others. But my own sense is that all four are really involved in um, everybody's psychological healing, physical healing, um, So I want to work with all four dimensions with my clients. I want to work with how they are in their body, what's happening in terms of their diet, their exercise, to what extent they are, not just have a physical practice, but to what extent they can feel their feelings in their body. I know many really good yoga teachers who are really in their body in one way, but totally out of touch with their feelings. You can be in your body and still out of touch with your feelings. So I also want to get people in touch with their feelings in the body. The opening of the heart through the relationship, through the past, um, through the current outside life, working with the mind in the same way as cognitive therapists do, looking for irrational beliefs. And spiritually, how do we work to create both a spiritual field and to also work um, I got, I got pretty sick about five years ago, and in my own healing I realized that I had been pretty unaware of the energetic dimension of psychotherapy, and I had been like this. In opening the heart, I had opened up energetically to all of my clients, everything. <laughs> I was like a motel room, it's a vacancy, a room available. <laughs> and so, this is still a pretty new part for me, I felt like a beginner here. Because I'm trying to practice good energy hygiene with my clients. Where I want to be as open in the heart as possible, but I would not want to be so open that I'm letting in everything. I want to have good energy boundaries as well. I want the room and the space to have a clear energy field. Um, I want to make sure that other influences around us are also good. Um, okay, I'm out of time. Thank you. Hmm. I am Vladimir Maikov. I am um, the president of Russian Association of Transpersonal Psychology and Psychotherapy and chair of Transpersonal Psychology at Moscow Institute of Psychoanalysis. And during lunch break, break uh, with Stephen A. Line, uh, my very good friend, we visited Whole Food Store. And then remind me uh, a story I heard from Stan Grof about the founder of Whole Food Store who got the very idea of uh, such business from uh, his experience participating in uh, holotropic breathwork with Stan in New York many years ago. <coughs> and later he published his story in New, uh, New York Times magazine. And it brings into uh, my mind a uh, thought that even short, uh, really transpersonal experience can change your life completely. It's irreversible. What you put there into your mind, it's impossible to extract again out. There is no delete button inside. <laughs> we uh, we uh, uh, will keep everything. And so even small seed of real experience can catalyze a really great change. And we can find uh, this uh, in uh, many wisdom tradition, in traditional societies. Uh, John kabat in uh, his book, Wherever You Go, There You Are, um, uh, share the uh, custom of Vietnamese peasant. They are walking on rice field, and in spontaneous moment, uh, the bell is ringing in the village, and they stop the walk, and they look into sky. <coughs> there is sky. And we, like sky, are infinite. And then they go uh, back uh, to uh, rice field, to everyday activity. And then, in unpredictable moment, again, the bell ring. 
and they again stop and they again remember who they really are. So I think that the main uh, transpersonal practice is to remember who we really are. Rem uh, and uh, 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 it was uh, Georgi uh, Ivanovich Gurdjieff who always taught the students, remember who you are, who used uh, different alarms to reawake them and to return them back. And so uh, for me, um, the main connection between transpersonal and uh, practice with life is just remember and just be. Uh, in a sense, uh, we can say that uh, before transpersonal, chop wood, carry water. And after transpersonal, <laughs> chop wood, carry water. And uh, uh, I can say, um, uh, um, uh, uh, peri um, rephrasing, uh, rephrasing famous uh, John Reed book, Ten Days That Shocked the World, something like that, yes? Uh, uh, we, can, uh, we, we can think about ten uh, great transpersonal events that change the world, irreversibly, <coughs> or will change. First, first uh, satellite. Uh, in 1975, satellite uh, was sent uh, to cosmos, and the old citizen of Earth, uh, Earth uh, uh, saw this picture of Earth from cosmos. Who we are looking at this picture? Where we are? Directly in cosmos. So this event pull, extract all uh, uh, our mind into cosmos and make all us initiated, all humanity, into transpersonal. Second, Hoffman, Watzman, Groff and all other psychedelic pioneers. It's irreversible. It's impossible to delete psychedelic revolution and its impact on our society. Third, um, what is third? <laughs> ah, third, it's uh, uh, a cartography of a real cartography, extended cartography of psyche. <clears throat> it was Groff, uh, who first from Western scientists proved uh, the uh, uh, wisdom of uh, ancient tradition. We are not limited. We are infinite. The nature of psyche is shunyata, unlimited uh, possibility. Fourth, internet, Silicon Valley, communicative revolution. It's just manifestation of in the nature of our consciousness. Our consciousness, uh, it's infinite. There is no limits in communication in ideal uh, or God consciousness. So it's just embodied. Fifth, uh, forming of global world, global village. Is it reversible? I don't think so. Sixth, revolution in education. It's completely transpersonal impact on everything. Seven, um, Um, reconnecting uh, with uh, uh, all human wisdom of all tradition, of all cultures. Uh, eight. Exploit of creativity everywhere, in every field. Nine. Care of the universe, not only by your family, your nation, universe. And ten. Guess what? Global future, global enlightenment. It should be irreversible. So, thank you. Thank you, panel. Once again, are there any questions for our panelists? racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, and other forms of social and cultural uh, oppression be worked with within or addressed within transpersonal uh, psychotherapy? And if so, how? Well, I 
course, it has to. Um, if it doesn't, it's irrelevant. Um, <clears throat> the phrase of unity and diversity, um, it's like they're both there. Both difference is there and unity is there at the same time. So that's different than having the context of there's only difference. Only difference, it becomes hard to come together, in my own sense. I think the transpersonal framework allows for coming out of a basic sense of unity to appreciate that I find unity by getting into my difference, by individuating as fully as possible, I come into the unity. Um, <clears throat> I think that all of the work on diversity in all the schools that are going on um, sometimes misses this larger spiritual holding and framework, and that it's crucial for us really to come together and even really appreciate the extraordinary differences that are there. Sometimes spirituality is used to erase differences. There's only oneness. And I think increasingly the, d the direction of spirituality is to appreciate difference. I think that there is a law that uh, is uh, on the basis of our life, that is to make the two one, that is the life is making always the two one, that is unity and diversity is just two phases of the process of life, that is more I come in my center, more my consciousness expand. So my more I became unite and in my unity, more I am, I am able to bring the multiplicity. So to work with the, the state of consciousness, to work in a, with the transpersonal technology can help us and the humanity to respect the law of the life. I would just add one idea, and it's, a, it's an irony that just because a, a set of problems are very horrific, uh, slavery, for example, uh, racism, sexism, where uh, there is disrespect or abuse, just because the problem is horrific, we really should be open to the fact that the solution can be very, very simple. And I think very uh, easily about the power of friendship. Uh, I didn't uh, always know gay people, but as I became friends with gay people, the problem went away of who, who are they. I grew up at a time when I never saw a black person. From 19, I was born in 1949. And as I made best friends with black people, the problem went away. And so I no longer get, and I went to Russia five times, hmm. and I learned that the, what I felt as being a Savatsky, which is to be named a Russian in America uh, in the Cold War era of the 50s, I always was looked at like, are you the enemy or are you an American? And then when I went to Russia, they loved me, and I realized the brainwashing of our culture, our news, everything about the other. And the friendship made everything go away. So I would say uh, never underestimate the ability to make friends in a prison with murderers, which I did for five years. And you find out making friends with people helps them not be murderers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, we're going to be taking uh, a good long break, but um, it seems to me after a panel on practice that we should do something, a little bit of practice. practice. So I'm going to ask Stu to do another, like just a short two or three minute chant for us and just sure. review you the really experience something mm -hmm. nonverbal with a lot of words. So right. Can you? Happy to. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure you all have done some type of call and response chanting, yeah? Let's see. Well, it's very simple. We'll, we'll skip the complexity. We'll just do OM. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, um. So I'll go like this. Oh, um, oh, um, oh, um, oh, um. And then I'll do like in hip hop, I'll go like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, is this on? Yeah. Oh, um, oh, um, oh, um, oh, um. Then I'll do this, and guess what? You'll go. <laughs> oh, um, oh, um, oh, um. Do you have any <laughs> cigarette lighters or anything? <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll do the next line, which will be oh, um, oh, um, oh, um, oh, um, something like that. <laughs> and then I'll do this again, and we'll go back and forth. The only thing to watch out for is I'll speed up the tempo. Even in the two minutes, we'll get to a quite a rousing tempo. <laughs> <clears throat> invite you to take this presence and refresh yourselves. We'll gather back here at 20 after 5 for our last panel on research. Thank you.